Hello everyone, today we delve further in our Renaissance history series that I started from quite a while now uh, regarding especially the uh, wars between uh, say the Christendom, Parliament and the Turk, the, the Ottoman Empire you know that we mostly discuss the siege of Vienna and all the various political international diplomatic background to it which I find it to be particularly um, instructive as uh, we often give for granted kind of the you know the complexity of the uh, of, of these dimensions especially in a world that was so complicated of course to, to manage um, at least by some standards that are different from today not that today's world is uh, less complex but in a sense um, it's also more stable by a degree. At the time, you have a stability, of course, deriving from uh, the, the same reason why, paradoxically, the system was unstable. That is to say, you you could easily, um, say, unbalance one system internally, because at least those who rule there are relying on, you know, a significant um, support on kind of, in fact, non statal realities from communities that can at some point substitute themselves to the same state to a degree that today is unknown right and or at least is still rigidly disciplined by the some people think it's post westphalian others that it's post nation state uh, i prefer the latter actually as a, as a watershed um, but in that sense at the same time you have limited resources for which great wars of invasion and of conquest are rarely um, let's say uh, a, a rarer, right? At least by by scale um, and and achievement. Really, if you look at the same Ottoman front, you have this boom where, of course, the Ottomans managed to, to conquer really a lot uh, in a very short amount of time. But that was f essentially filling a vacuum that naturally was not qu only a vacuum; it was also the local peoples. Mm, actually supporting the Ottoman rule, which is yet another aspect that we have seen very often. That is to say, of course, from a Western perspective today, a Christian perspective, we say, well, okay, there is all a mythology um, around these this wars. Um, there is a sense of kind of a definition of a proper modern um, uh, European identity uh, through the, the wars against the Turk and so on. But we have seen very often how, you know, uh, many Ottomans were actually Christians, they were essentially just people who so were preferring that Turkish rule to the, say, the, the imperial one um, for reasons that are also very contingental. They're not just ideological uh, to core. Of course, you can look at, I don't know, at the Calvinist Hungarians under the Ottomans opposing the Catholic um, papal Habsburgs, right? So uh, there you cannot but see also what uh, the, the ancient rivalries between Hungary and the, the Germanic world had been historically since the time uh, of the Ottonians, you, you can argue. Um, so this goes along patterns that uh, depend much also on, on, the, on the figures, on the personalities, perhaps more than today. There are more things happening today but personalities are more tied, in a sense, to, to the system. And the reason is not even just that uh, personalities are, say, just more, um, you know, that they're literally constricted by choices, as today would have, as always, kind of a huge potential to do lots of things, like it was true at the time. But they tend just to accommodate themselves, because after all, we're less pressured, then, then other times historically we don't think we live under constant of you know uh, the, say uh, the the fear of imminent uh, threat overthrowing revolts revolutions confessional clashes um, we civilized over time to a degree that kind of artificially keeps much of the individual involvement down which uh, as opposed to previous times when um, such um, uh, rules were much more connected to it, uh, in fact. Now, um, today we talk specifically about the House of Este. So, we're talking about Ferrara, Modena, and Reggio, and so on. At the time of the Duke uh, Alfonso II, it would 
effectively be the last one of the probably of the Duchy of Ferrara because he uh, died without a male heir, and thus uh, this this duchy passed back to to the papal states, uh, as it had technically already been part of, in fact, as um, uh, a papal fief. And the Duchy of Modena and Reggio that would remain until the, the Italian unification went to the to to, a, to to another branch of the Hesse House. From the other side, you have the the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, ruled by the Medici, right? Um, that um, that was a more important uh, reality. However. A, a rivalry, not just because it had been, in fact, elevated in the imperial hierarchy to a grand duchy, as opposed to the uh, the Este one that had remained, you know, what had sort of remained, um, but that had this ancient rivalry due with with the, the Ferro race for just the origins of of, of of the of the power per se. Now we don't have time to digress on the history of the relation between the Este. And the Medici uh, just know, as, as it's known, that the Este were essentially one of the single most ancient and noble uh, dynasties in Europe. Uh, the Welfen even uh, were were actually coming from this this early uh, Germanic nobility that was ruling in Italy. If you think about Henry the Lion, this once the 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 Welfen, the Hohenstaufen, just know that that branch was. Originally at, of a Frankish origin, then had come back to to Germany to to rise to that important level in the 12th century, and the the House of Este thus had an enormous sense uh, of themselves. They, they were a modest power, right? And especially at this point, this is after the uh, Peace of Cateau Cambrésis uh, of 1559. So after the affirmation of the Habsburgic hegemony over the Italian Peninsula, you know that essentially Milan is under the Spanish. Um, also, southern Italy is under the Spanish. There are some other uh, garrisons there. It's, it's Spain that has essentially played the greater role in, in the Mediterranean. The, the Habsburgic uh, Austrians are, of course, cooperating, but they're not quite the, the same thing. You have to know that it would be just in the second modern age, like the Austrian rule. In northern Italy, in any case, um, this is a. You see, Italy is the only country that never had wars of religion on its soil. So, under that point of view, um, there was an, a, a Catholic, uh, Catholic hegemony, and not just because of the presence of the Pope and the, the Habsburgic alliance, uh, but also, generally speaking, the. Um, the the preconditions for which the Reformation had not spread uh, in the peninsula that, uh, in a way, kept things calm, right? You know, after the Italian wars, actually, uh, the peninsula um, lived under the Spanish, contrary to what is commonly believed, actually a phase of prosperity, right? This ended uh, in, the, in the 17th century, mostly with the plague, but there had been a major, actual demographic and economic expansion the um, Italian nobility had as you know had a, a role of uh, a place of honor among for example the the imperial generals also uh, the this is almost the years in fact the, of, of the 80 years war there are great names um, in modern military history connected to it and uh, also with these houses of course that we are we're looking at and perhaps I will make videos uh, about this. However, there was obviously um, a connection existing in Italy with the uh, French as well, and with the Ottomans that did pass through the Este as well. Naturally, there are many episodes, including I don't know the the siege of Otranto, for example, that had happened back in the day in the in the, in the 15th century. Why and how? Because you know, essentially, the the Medici. Tuscany had wanted to oppose at that point the King of Naples, um, so lots of kind of proxy wars that sometimes we see. Uh, I don't know that the Ottomans were invading the Italian Peninsula. They they didn't have much of a chance, right? The the, the problem was mostly the internal balance, and so what these states felt most confident to to do against one another without much of a. Uh, in that case, probably. Uh, much even of, 
of an actual risk of making the thing escalating to something worse, right? There had been Ottoman raids, we made videos about this, also in North Eastern Italy, uh, in Friuli mainly, and together with, uh, you know, Southeastern Germany, uh, and so on. So, um, definitely we are, especially after the Battle of Lepanto, in, in a condition of full kind of, uh, can again, talk properly of blocks just per se, but it's obvious that there is this Ottoman giant next door, and Italy is still the essentially the richest country in the world. It has it, it has one of the greatest, essentially the the, the language of modern Europe uh, in any scientific philosophical field is Italian. At this point, you have um, let's say a, a status quo that could hardly ever be changed. The Ottoman Lepanto proved just by itself, given that it was mostly. A victor of the Italian navies, right? You know, under the flags of the Habsburgs, or the Spanish, or other, etc. But that, you know, that the Ottoman capacity to wage war, um, because these were the two axes: uh, either the Balkans and Central Europe, or Italy. Right, as far as the Ottoman invasion of Christian Europe um, could do, was much more complicated in the in the latter case, right? You know, the the Italian. Um, operations would have required against a massive naval commitment, a constant uh, siege uh, involvement in all every single stronghold. It's some of again here we're talking about the Tras uh, Italien, all the some of, some of the most updated military engineering um, available. Uh, again, uh, an enormous papal effort coordination, and still the fact that there were essentially two open fronts, distinctly speaking. Also at sea, and especially enough after people say that Lepanto didn't have quite of a uh, of a strategic consequence. Um, that that's deeply mis misunderstanding what strategic really means, right? You know, the strategic doesn't mean that you lose, uh, you know, or win territory as a form of, you know, it's, it's just if that doesn't happen, there is not a a strategic quantity that has changed. Strategy has to do with the employment of the means for the end of the war, right? So the armed forces for the end of the war. And after that defeat, the Ottomans realized that the Western Mediterranean couldn't simply, or even the Central Mediterranean for that matter, couldn't be simply entered, right, without consequences. And that um, in order to, to proceed, right, to further expansion in that direction, remember that there had been the siege of Malta, uh, that had failed, there had been more successful ones in the Eastern Mediterranean, but um, that side of the Alps was much more complicated to operate, especially now that the Italian wars had ended with the defeat of France and the, the, the victory of the Habsburgs, so um, the same dynasties that um, uh, were fighting, in fact, from potentially from Italy uh, and or, however, with some Italian states that remained independent and that were, however, just following that that uh, the trend. Because again, aside from these uh, machinations, we'll see now. Uh, of course, they didn't want uh, the peninsula to be invaded, the 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 trade to be altered. Right? There is also with the Venetians, of course, an alternation of war and peaceful relations uh, with the Sublime Gate and so on. But essentially, there, this is the same bloc that is fighting also in Central Europe, right? In uh, in Hungary and the Carpathians, and even supporting with Venetian, in fact, and Austrian money. I don't know the Serbian Hajduks and the resistance in the Balkans and all these kind of things. Um, that of course puts the Ottomans under pressure. Always maintained us that the Ottomans had three frontiers open at the same time constantly throughout all their history. At this point, Suleiman the Magnificent is dead, and that was essentially the, the peak of Ottoman powers, you know, in many ways. Now, especially after Lepanto, things seem to have resized a little bit um, in, another, uh, in another direction with another uh, orientation. But as we've seen also in the videos about um, Vienna 1683, uh, the, the, the Ottomans still uh, until the end of the 17th century, did take the Italian theater in consideration, because it was that, right? It's either Central Europe or Italy, right? And um, don't think that even 
you know, eventually they chose Vienna, but as we've seen in those videos, even Warsaw technically could be, through the Vistula Valley, um, a viable target, right? And um, history could have objectively gone very different directions had certain issues happened. And that's why I created essentially this playlist, because it tells you how much was uh, agitating uh, behind... Um, you know what what we see uh, you know that on Trapunk I don't talk much about modern history but it seems to me that the general western popular awareness on these topics is uh, particularly low right I, as a medievalist I have anti-modernistic prejudices and I mean especially for, from an historiographical point of view meaning that to me uh, you know I have I confess it. I have a problem. I have a you know, a negative bias towards the uh, the modernists. Uh, I mean, the scholars who teach modern history. That's what I mean by modern, because um, I don't think they teach it well in the first place. And uh, the modern age, especially the early modern age, um, say in the second one, you have more hype for some countries that uh, begin to see that their their uh, in fact their nations kind of emerging in a in a powerful way, right? If you look at the history of the Netherlands, of of um, England, eventually Britain, um, and um, I don't know Prussia, for example. In part, it's true also for the Habsburgs, but the Habsburgs have this kind of older legacy that sometimes is also left out. I don't, I don't see much German history uh, properly taught uh, or publicized, and also behind the even just the, the most important wars or, or battles but just politically or culturally the same goes for italy the same goes for uh, i said germany but we could we, we could extend this to, to central europe broadly meant um and um even the balkans i mean even the, the entire problem of of the ottoman uh, the, the turkish wars venice etc it, it's actually one of the single most fascinating uh, chapters in uh, in European history, but at the same time, I don't see it properly laid out well. Right? It's either, especially on YouTube, certain say m m creators trying to appeal to that sense of proto-nationalistic uh, hype, like say, "Oh, look, this is, there is a country with my flag, so I, I am going to, you know, to cheer for that." Right? Or um, there is some kind of, I will show you now, tough soldiers in pictures and say, oh my god, this war is so cool, it looks so aesthetic and whatever. And then, then the, the most important political and cultural, and also the, mil the, the truly important military stuff is kind of left out, consequently speaking. You know that I cared since the beginning of Schwerpunkt about um, making, in fact, modern... Uh, modern warfare content and I've always been toying still to this day with the idea of introducing a modern history series because even though I'm not a modernist again I could surely make very easily basic modern history lessons but I also would like to go a bit more in depth and I think this cat let's say looking at some polities in detail we often talk about Central Europe today we talk about Italy regarding the, the Ottoman relations and so on, is, is fascinating. And today I actually make a, a very simple um, video, right? I, I will tell the history of, of, a, of a prank that was played on by the Grand Duke of Tuscany on the Duke of Este, of Ferrara, um, that ha allows... <laughs> Um, to highlight uh, a specific mentality, a specific direction, let's say, that um, the, in this case, the, the Este, but you could see it in a broader sense uh, of the Italians and, and the Westerners, towards the Ottomans, right? This idea that, of course, there were deep intersections, right? Properly, as I was saying before, what, in fact, that, that's why I think that that aspect, that, that part of Europe, right is the ottoman frontier is forgotten a bit in perspective because i think that probably the concept of modern europe as we know it derives from the relations with the ottomans 
it's not the most advanced areas as they would take uh, off as say they, they had already been structured so as national monarchies um, in in the Middle Ages, talking about Spain, France, Britain, and that eventually, especially the latter two, bring ahead like the most important colonial empires, world domination, and so on. That that is just in part also a consequence of not of being from the diametrically opposite side of of the Ottoman frontier or the Ottoman Empire proper in Europe. Right, and so this is fascinating. For example, we've seen it in, in German history how, I don't know, at the time of Vienna there, there were some, not even Protestant princes at some point, they were fined with the French rather stamping in the Rhineland without doing, without the Augsburgs, of course, uh, being able to do much about it at that point. Um, and um, uh, let's say uh, preferring that and even you know, the, uh, a Turkish Vienna that could have been an historical thing to the Habsburgs and the papacy, which is kind of uh, fascinating and tells you a lot also in terms of sheer kind of Westerners also. What is that we come from, technically, uh, at some points, aside from the kind of more heroic um, tales that we can uh, make it is not to say again you know i'm i'm a great um i'm a great admirer of any true civilization that manages to emerge you know where or another there are some peoples like i don't know the dutch for example is there are truly some of the single most successful people in in history like again like the swiss actually marginal people that because of their determination and kind of sometimes luck but surely a lot of hard work and 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 war managed to sediment a unspeakable amount of wealth right something that just in 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 europe we don't have tr say truly rich countries in europe are just i don't know you, you look at the uk well in general because of the legacy of the british empire but in in the smaller sense like you look at Say Norway is a truly rich country, right? not Sweden. And, um, the, the Netherlands are a truly, I mean, very rich country. Switzerland is a very rich country. The other ones are rich, like Western Europe is rich, um, in a rather homogeneous way. Um, but it, it, it hadn't say if you look at these smaller entities that technically even evolved from, let's say. Um, relics that didn't seem to have any specific national profile and managed to be become so because, you know, you, you could have the Dutch could have been part of Germany and the same is true for for the Swiss, right? You know, um, managed to to be there and to be relevant and to be successful till to this day because of um, of something that evidently succeeded. If anything, even from the failure of other of other powers. Look at Spain, look at the same, in fact, the same kind of secessions from the Holy Roman Empire, um, and so on. And we have to realize, however, that this did happen also because there were enormous resources spent elsewhere for a threat that these peoples were not facing directly, or at least that they were, fa they were facing other threats. Um, in the sense, the, f the, the role of Spain is fascinating because... The Spanish had naturally an interest in dominating the, the North Sea, the Baltic, and so the Eighty Years' War was in many ways, a, um, you know, a very relevant clash. Not not just for, you know, the Dutch obviously, but for the same Spanish Empire. But they were kind of more timid at sea, right? As we were saying before, like the, the Italian uh, states, for example, were quite legitimately freaky about. Uh, the Ottoman piracy, because Italy has something like 3,000 kilometers of, of, of coasts, and I don't know if you have an idea of what it means by the, the, the 16th, or even still the 17th century, to, to, to defend from piracy, from raids, etc., such uh, an extended amount of coastland. And there are some dynamics that actually, daily news, right, even think about today's immigration for, from North Africa, there are issues that have always been there, in that um, I think a common Western and especially European uh, awareness should be a bit more kind of, you know, in 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 the first place, historical, 
right? I would say objective in a way, but there is something about the diachronic value of, of the analysis that should always be considered as well. Um, so let's get to the thing, right? So in the mm, what, what does this video want to point out? What, well, to the fact that there are many examples of this. Um, some we have already hinted at in other videos, but the fact in general that in the political and diplomatic reality, of course, uh, a, a continuous war against the, the Turk was not quite just there, right? Not because it was too costly, which was a problem in that sense as much as, say, in this case of the Italians, but also of the Ottomans themselves, meaning that, you know, when, let's say, Venice or Constantinople were at war with each other, you know, they both lost, right? Th these are the years in which the the Portuguese, the, the Spanish have opened the Atlantic routes, right? So the, 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 they, they, they fought against the Ottomans in the Indian Ocean, there was the early colonization of India. There are lots of interesting things going on. Um, and at some point, the Ottomans and the Italians were some Italy that was losing its uh, economical centrality with the opening of the Atlantic routes, of course. Um, and the Ottomans that were still a Mediterranean power were, of course, together in this kind of look that there are other markets that are opening and we're not so much the, the center of the world as um, we had been before, right? So there is um, a dramatic intersection that we've seen if you uh, travel across Central Europe, all the beautiful Schatzkammer that, that we have, in, let's say, in the German, in, in the Austrian, uh, yeah, in the Polish, I mean, it's plain in, in Czechia and Slovakia, etc. Of, of properly of um, of rooms filled with um, what are not necessarily praise of war, but literal copies of Ottoman panoplies. Right, that the Christian princes were so obsessed to 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 give to one another to be uh, because the Ottoman Empire was perceived as just an enormous power that also considered that there is no such thing like contemporary ethno-anthropology. There is uh, no thing such as ethno-nationalism. There is no such thing like um, uh, scientific racism, uh, there, th th which doesn't mean that there wasn't discrimination or, or kind of that was also, a, of course, a fierce idea, of course, of what the... the, the Probably even the racial differences by a degree really were, but it, it's it's a word that reasons with completely different patterns by a large degree from our own, um, and we'll see this better in the end because when today we think about the Turks, we have mostly um, say in some countries there is of course like in, in fact in, if you look at the Italian or the German perspective there, there's an idea of the Turks right because these countries developed kind of again they were on the floor against the Ottomans, and they kind of had their histories molded by the relation with the Turk that is much more deeply ingrained than, say, the French or the British have, uh, the one they have. Um, and um, the there is an early taste for kind of global education, like uh, still today, I mean, at, at this point in history, uh, I mean, back at the time, there were this great scholars, polymaths, that uh, alchemists that wanted essentially to sort out the world for what it was. And so there are very interesting texts to see how, for example, I don't know, the, the, the early modern people understood ancient Egypt, right? Today, we, I think as kids, we, are, we grow up even just knowing more or less by, by secondhand information what Egyptology is about. Um, some things were being discovered just at the time, and there was a sort of classicistic mentality about it, for which um, also these countries were, of course, they, they were traveled, uh, they were, people knew about them, there was a deep exchange, as we'll see now. But the general feeling was, was not the one you could have by, I don't know, the 20th century, 21st century, where you consider the, the Islamic world as kind of, you know, yeah, a bit of a you know racistic term. Let's say that like the brown people, the ones that you know, uh, the, the the religious fanatics, the 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 the, the suicide bombers, and all these kind. It that there are also something else. There are the immigrants. There are whatever. There is 
kind of a somehow universalistic neutral idea of the fact that aside from the Christian issues, because of course Islam was by a degree even thought to be an anomaly at the time, right? You know, but it was still framed within a biblical mentality for which anomalies are truly un true anomalies. You you don't quite see the world in other ways, right? Ju just at this point, there was something slightly changing, but it was mostly um, an erudite scholarly perspective was timidly taking shape. And the Ottomans were seen as just some of some a great empire, like as you could say, ancient Egypt or ancient uh, Rome. Like it was something so big uh, that it was appreciated for the value of the imperial, universal, traditional, and uh, in actual strength, as they had measured it in, in on the battlefield at sea uh, or, or on land. That was difficult to frame categorically. Right, consider that the Ottomans, as we've seen it many times, were technically speaking, and mostly, especially for what the Europeans so Europeans, right? Uh, it's not just because Constantinople is in Europe, but because, again, uh, you would have tons of Serbians, of Bulgarians, of uh, lots of people that you just normally see this. This is an Ottoman soldier, but they were actual Christians and, you know, just Europeans. Uh, but also because, of course, the Ottomans had uh, made a huge effort to um, to gather as much as, mm, say, uh, symbology, right? In a broader sense, or legitimization tools of whichever kind as possible to appeal to, first of all, those subjects. I mean, the, Romalia could have never been conquered if the Ottomans had not presented something better, uh, a better option, let's say, that, that what the Byzantines or other, I don't know, the Serbians or other powers in the Balkans uh, were presenting, right? These peoples at some point properly, I mean, Constantinople notoriously fell because the gates were opened, right? Because the Greeks found, this, you know, after all, a continuity with what uh, was happening before the Ottoman emperors were and it doesn't matter that they weren't recognized as such in the West because the important there is how they were recognized in their own empires institutions as Roman emperors they were Caesars right it was one of the many titles that they bore next to the Islamic ones the kind of the ones of more kind of turco mongolian uh, taste um, and, and others, but they had acquired an enormous lot of just the previous tradition, even just the classicistic one. I mean, this is the full Renaissance, right? So the Ottomans were also doing their share as far as also, if, if, if it had been only for receiving, of course, um, lots of Western literates, craftsmen, I mean, the 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 the, the crown slash tiara of of Suleiman, the, the Magnificent, is, is one of the most famous one. You, you know Suleiman uh, the Magnificent, mostly from, as you know, beautiful uh, Italian portraits, like the ones that could be about Charles the the uh, Fifth. You have full, full of Westerners, Frenchmen, because of the alliance with France, Italians, and more, and all these other peoples um, coming from everywhere. We, we've seen even if it had been freed slaves, people from I don't know Ukraine or, of course, other. Um, other individuals from the same Balkans and so on. Um, so you have there something difficult even to present, like, again, as we think from the 19th century onwards, like, the Ottomans are just, um, you know, the 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 the, the uh, Islamic kind of alter, non-European kind of different in race or whatever from us, right? If you look at Mozart's works, some of the most beautiful ones, of course, they, they present the Ottoman Empire as brutal, as crude in, in something, but still magnificent, still kind of opulent, still, you know, provided with a reliable uh, sentimentalism of, of some sort. And so, um, we are, we must make the effort to reason like a 16th century person, which is impossible, but we, we at least have to try to to 
to see from, from the eyes of a Westerner what also the power of the Ottoman Empire per se represent. Don't get me wrong, this, this has nothing to do with saying that there wasn't hatred, that there wasn't a religious war, uh, even though wars were always religious, so it's actually even redundant to call them religious. Instead, many people don't want to call them religious wars because they think it's other economic wars, man. You know, and, and there you realize that you're talking to a, to a minus habens. Um, but um, it was ferocious. Uh, I mean, people were skinned alive, roasted alive. Uh, was slavery everywhere? That was revived actually in the modern age, uh, because in in the Middle Ages, especially in, in the latter part, there wasn't much slavery. In the Mediterranean, it re resumed, um, especially with the wars against the Ottomans. Um, so all this was completely normal, together with literally a different and less kind of uh, ideologized view of the Ottomans, at least in the way we, we tend to do today, right? Um, it's a, th this premise is important, in my opinion, because um, history doesn't admit, uh, let's say, things like truly personal opinions. I mean, of course, it admits it as far as you have to express a historical judgment of sort, but you are talking about realities that really existed. So, not something you can't simply pretend to 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 interpret your own way, but that are technically like now hyper studied, hyper known, and so just you know taking a subjective take on them um, for your personal inclinations is not really leading anywhere nowadays, or at least there are spaces where this can be done, but it's not the case of how we work really in history. Um, so the, the, uh, the Turk was looked upon also with admiration, not l also just down with, with fury and uh, and vindicative feelings, right? Uh, it was not an eternal and irre irremissible enemy. Um, and many things demonstrated this directly or indirectly. Because it was just another, yet another power, right? It's as if today, again, we could make an example with Turkey even today, right? It's not the best NATO member, um, but essentially it's that same kind of power that you have to to maintain in a way in well of course today it's it's a completely different situation i mean politically or strategically but that still you must be pragmatic about uh, uh in many ways this, the, the same could be said for for other you know non cooperative european countries that wink at i don't know either uh you know at strategic um uh, competitors, to say the least, and other things. But overall, let's say at least we achieved this big deal of being a fundamentally a compact Europe, and especially in the major countries, against um, significant threats. Just we should translate this in a more integrated, common, you know, defense, which I think also the current events are going to unavoidably sprint like a bit further. If it hadn't been for the French voting against that in the 50s, we would have already had now from 70 years um, something like a common European defense, but let's skip this aspect. In any case, we're thankful to have France. Um, just there could be better ways to handle a lot of things. Here we talk specifically of, again, something we can just get indirectly from a prank that the, uh, the Christian princes played sometimes on one another, right? And this one is actually, well, I can say it's famous again in, in pop culture because pop culture is not culture, <laughs> as a matter of fact, or at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, but, you know, if you, if you ever studied the early modern Europe in some detail of sort, you... Um, there is this this fact that occurred um, just five years after Lepanto in, in 1576 that concerned Alfonso II of Este, Duke of Ferrara, um, 
that I introduced before, um, and that, among other things, was known for his uh, boundless ambition, as much as for the jealousy towards the House of Medici that had managed in the imperial feudal hierarchy to achieve the ducal rank. You know, that the Florentine Republic had fundamentally stepped towards a more dynastic direction after, you know, d during the Italian wars, fundamentally, it had uh, uh, sunk, right, uh, you know, on other powers. And in order to stabilize a kind of um, a more compact and stable government, it was elevated to Grand Duchy, it was fundamentally kind of dynastic, more authoritative power uh, on the say, by Habsburgic uh, interest, right? And the Medici had remained there uh, um, through different branches compared to the initial one in male line, but um, still. And this was a big deal because, as we were saying before, the Este were much more noble than the Medici. That's the point we didn't make before. I mean, the Medici were bankers. They had been born not as noblemen, as feudal nobility dating back to, to the high middle ages they were commoners right the Medici were already around from quite a while right if you read in the 14th century the early 14th century when they they appear among uh, in the city struggles in Florence and so on um, they were already powerful but they just emerged from just most of the um, Italian communal aristocracies from just census, right, social status, not feudal appointment, right, and they had become, however, one of the most important uh, houses in Europe anyway, married into royalty, uh, etc., Queen of France had been meditated by this point, this, this had something to do with the Este connection with the, still the French, the Duke of Guise, and the, uh, also the, the, the wars of religion in France, right, uh, the rivalry, in fact, between the two houses had been uh, maintained. I mean, fully enough, because Ferrara was making more of a, say, not an open French uh, policy, actually, because they couldn't afford, especially at this point, much of that. Um, they were loyal to the Habsburgs. They sent troops uh, to, in Austria to fight against the, the Ottomans there. I mean, they, they were just normal nobles of the empire, normal subjects uh, of the Roman Catholic emperor, uh, and um, that was it, right? The Medici were, have been, sound, as you know, the, the richest bankers uh, in, in Europe, and they uh, thus could boast an enormous legacy of prestige, of wealth, of culture, and so on. Now they had partially um, you know, decayed um, after the Italian wars, but they still were ranked more importantly than than the Est at the time. And these um, Italian noblemen were quite sensitive to this kind of stuff. I mean, they, of course, there was always a competition they had to show off who was more of a who could hold more of an international court and who could be in this sense. Uh, you know, co-opted by the highest spheres, um, and there were many various um, mechanisms, for example, so the papal court, the imperial court, that could make one faction rise as opposed to another, uh, and so on. Um, and yes, I couldn't take this fact that they were dukes, while the Medici were grand dukes at this point. Uh, naturally, Tuscany was a more important power than, than Ferrara, just per se, so that's kind of obvious too. But the, the blood, right, the nobility traditionally was, was about that, and the Medici were still seen as the bankers, as commoners, etc. Um, in, uh, in that kind of posh sense, even though they married into royalty and so on, doesn't matter. Blood matters for them, right? Um, and Carried away by his pride, Alfonso of Este had sought even to adjudicate himself 
the elective crown of Poland, uh, among the various things. There, there was a connection there between Poland, France, the Este, right later on, it would be also with the Gonzaga and so on. However, um, the, um, the, 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 they had tried also, of course, to, to, to close the ties with the Habsburgs as well, because also the Medici were, were married into the Habsburgs and so on. In 1576, however, and this is the episode, um, um, essentially a, a man in Turkish clothes, Turkish costume, uh, presented himself at the court of Ferrara, the court of Alphonse. And, he, um, and, and this man exhibited some credentials of the Sultan Murad III, thus per- essentially presenting himself as a, you know, uh, an Ottoman am- ambassador. The documents presented by this alleged ambassador um, expressed the desire of the Ottoman Sultan who was impressed by the fame of the Duke and animated by an extraordinary benevolence towards him uh, to make, in fact, the same Alfonso, King of Jerusalem. I already made a video of how the Medici later on in the 17th century would actually try an expedition to seize uh, Jerusalem. It, it was carried out, it failed, but just to make you understand how important it was, still this title of kingdom uh, of King of Jerusalem was held at this point by various rulers because they all claimed essentially the uh, the overlordship of the remains of what had probably existed as the Kingdom of Jerusalem. First of all, to reconquer it, but also of other houses that had extinguished and or you know from lands that had been conquered by the Turks, such as Cyprus and so on. That, so that many sovereigns in Europe have said, I'm the king of Jerusalem, I'm the... The title still exists, so it's also fascinating to look at that. And at the time, in a world where still, again, the Ottomans were essentially still at the fact that the peak of their power, at least they had been lately uh, stopped by, uh, by this uh, great naval showdown at Lepanto and so on, but they... You know, the, the the title of King of Jerusalem was um, really meaningful in, in, a, in a time of confessional, religious clashes, and more. Um, and this embassy was somehow bizarre, because um, while Alfonso uh, entertained for, for a long time, a, a, you know, a part of uh, the say a discussion with the, this strange guest and he gave order thus by the way to 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 honor him and to treat him princely he also realized that there was something strange about this all because what would be the point of the ottomans to to simply confer to the duke of Este the, the, the title of king of jerusalem uh, for right at this point, right the 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 kingdom of Jerusalem. This could be, of course, that doesn't entail quite the rule over Jerusalem that the Ottomans would have controlled anyway. But since the title feudally maybe could have been used politically, if sponsored by the Ottomans in a way, uh, intervening international policy, but it was just strange because there was nothing setting them up for this. Thus, Alfonso had this allegedly Turkish ambassador uh, surveilled with great care, because the, the, the point was, who, who the hell is this guy, right? Just imagine it, like we're in the 16th century, you don't have immediate responses from governments, from whatever, you have to send messengers and so on. So this um, meeting had surely flattered him. Alfonso was, again, always looking for aggrandizing his own rule and persona and so on. Definitely he he had not been convinced by this whole thing. Um, and the Duke of Ferrara thus provided to send to Constantinople a trusty courier that could verify 
the authenticity of this document that, by the way, had been presented and you know false, falsified, presumably. Uh, also, you know, in a way that would uh, would be serious for the Ottomans, because you know, if Murad had not given any order of that kind, who was this person? Why was he acting like that? Right. So the point was just yes, they wanted to know directly from the Ottomans what what was going on with this guy. And having noticed that the Duke, after the first meeting, um, this uh, you know the he hey, the, the the ambassador had not been called right you know again, and that um, actually the the reaction was that the the Este guards were always around him. That this alleged Ottoman ambassador. Uh, you know, become became suspicious himself, and he managed to to escape. Right, he was actually captured, uh, but he managed to escape once again, and he was so uh, capable that he managed to have his uh, you know traces lost completely. Right, and nobody knew how and why. Right, possibly he knew the region well, right, he had possibly some uh, some help uh, in in the Duchy of Ferrara, we, we don't know this, but it's likely, right, that somebody had been, you know, behind him, had, oh, uh, helping him to, to escape and to give him shelter and to, to move elsewhere, right. Uh, in the meanwhile, the ducal Ambassador, it's a messenger, say better, had come back from Constantinople uh, uh, to Ferrara, confirming, right, with the news that he brought uh, from the Sultan's court, the ducal suspects, because nobody had uh, ever thought in Constantinople. Uh, about Alfonso as the future king of Jerusalem. The Ottomans had told him, we don't know anything about this embassy. We haven't sent them these documents you talk about or, you know, have not been signed. Nobody has ever even conceived right, that at this point, right, you should use this title or give it to the Duke of Esther, whatever. Uh, so what actually we think happened is that Alfonso had remained victim of a prank that had been played on him by the Grand Duke of Tuscany, Francis I. Francis I is an interesting uh, figure. He was the son of Cosimo, the son of uh, John of uh, the Black Bands. Um, he, uh, he, he was like his father, like, but kind of Authoritarianly or oriented, he had a deep connection with the Habsburgs that we were talking about before. He was famous for alchemy, right? This was the century that this this is we're transitioning to the Baroque era by, by a degree, and at that point there was a great fascination with natural sciences um, on the base of classical uh, tradition and the possibility of you know, replicating gold especially, uh, etc. Um, however, we have also seen how between these two dynasties there was more than a rivalry, right? Actually, there was even just more than the antipathy and or this, this problem of the, the Grand Duchy as opposed to the Duchy or the blood of the Medici and so on. Um, this had been uh, aggravated by a matter of ceremonial precedences at the same court of um, the Emperor Charles V, who had died uh, now from from almost 20 years, um, where they had been around before. And that had went on uh, in uh, 1558, on the occasion of the marriage between Lucrezia de' Medici, that was the daughter of Cosimo I, 
Cosimo the First as Grand Duke, not Cosimo the Elder. Um, and the same, the same Alfonso. Alfonso had been married with the daughter of the Grand Duke of Tuscany. And at, at that point, he was still the son and heir of uh, Hercules II, right, Duke of Este. Um, the marriage was uh, actually they liked each other. They, you know, it was um, obviously a um, uh, um, dynastic tie. It was to essentially improve also the Este condition. Paradoxically, there and trying to mitigate also this rivalry with the Medici trying to, for example, establish some, in fact, dynastic connections. It would have maybe at some point even introduced them in, in Tuscany uh, themselves. However, Lucrezia died, uh, as it was sadly frequent at the time, after only two years of marriage, if I'm not wrong, because of labor. It was, was typical um, at the time. In any case, at, at that point, the, the interesting aspect is also another ramification that um, Anna was Alfonso's sister, right? They were the children of Hercules II, um, and who had married Francis, Duke of Guise, right? Uh, and lived in France, um, had um, become furious because she had really, she hated the Florentines, right? Uh, at the French court, the problem is that of course, the Medici and the uh, Guise party were mostly like the Catholic and the and the, the Calvinist ones, right? And uh, there was all a story behind that because um, the mother of Alfonso and of Anne, the the the, the wife of Hercules II, was um, René de France, right? She was a uh, um, French princess who was Calvinist and she had caused a lot of problems because she had naturally she had married the Duke of Este she had been brought to Ferrara and this was Papal States technically and the Pope was extremely concerned with that so much that Alfonso had basically to take his mother away from the court um, and the Papal envoys were always checking whether at the Este court, there, there would be any Protestant there um, that could, you know, say, be a, first of all, a French foothold of some sort, but especially, say, uh, um, still properly a, a room that they, has, they could have been also motivated by a religious factor of some sort and cultivating circles of Protestants. There were some Protestants in Italy. Mostly they were kind of elite figures. Um, like, as we were saying before, there wasn't in Italy like uh, the spread of Protestantism. I mean, the, the, again, it was mostly uh, an intellectual phenomenon that was somehow uh, repressed by the Inquisition and so on. There had never been problems of that kind, but this thing that Calvin, especially considered that Alfonso as the new heir, as the new ruler of of, of Este, was uh, was very attached to his mother's family, um, and he had been brought up in France at the court of France with, uh, together with his cousin, the the, the King Henry the Second, right. So there was all, um, you know, again a, a connection there with the. You see, in fact, also in the arms of the of the dynast there, the you know the the French fleur de lis and the, and all this, um, and it was naturally very prestigious. But in in a region that had de facto been hegemonized by by the Habsburgs, so that wouldn't look at France uh, in a particularly you know. Uh, favorable way. Telling you the truth, also the Medici, as we've seen in that video about the crusade uh, to reconquer Jerusalem, were trying. Those were different times. It was in the in the 17th century, but they were trying to to wink at France a little bit to get rid of kind of the Spanish presence. That's how it would actually occur later on, right? The Spanish presence in Italy was somehow light, right? You know, as soon as essentially the, the 
power began to decline it was immediately a replacement with French fashion so um, it was mostly an occupation of some of the most important strategic areas but most of Italy was somehow free to even side with um, in a more an orthodox way in fact by some degree, uh, that is evident with the same France that, that sided with the Ottomans. So you understand the link here. The French, the Calvinists, uh, France is not, of course, a Calvinist country, but there, some of these very powerful royalty, the, the Guise with which Anne of Esther had also married into, and as we've seen, the, the same Alfonso and Anne were the son of a French princess, and so on, meant also a, a possible inclination towards the Ottomans themselves that France made um, a leverage on to, to harass the Habsburgs and all their subjects, right? Um, the, um, say, Anne of Guise, Esther, of course, as we've seen, had a very high sense of herself. She thought that the Medici were just bankers, were to of too low uh, of a birth to confront uh, themselves with the French, with the Este. Um, and again, n the nobility felt really a lot these differences. As we've seen, Lucrezia had uh, died in 1561 almost uh, immediately, so that um, ephemeral marriage alliance between the Medici and the Este had once again being uh, dissolved, right? Remember, Alfonso, as we were saying before, even looked at Austria, looked at Poland. There was a lot that the Estes could, could achieve through this dynastic connections, but they were ever varying. Um, now, there is a, a reflection on the prank that we described that can be interesting, right? Because... Aside from all of the... You understand it was a joke. Like, uh, Alfonso could not quite be fooled by the fact that, you know, the title of King of Jerusalem conferred by the Ottomans just a few years after Lepanto was just on the base of, oh my God, US, they are so cool, so rich, so so magnificent, whatever. It was kind of weird uh, and out of place. Um, however, one must understand also the subtlety of, of the mockery here mm, because uh, initially uh, Alfonso's credulity can of course be uh, also funny per se because better you know, because they wouldn't know legitimately up to a certain point where what what the whole thing was about um, but um, was there anything about this Ottoman flattery that could have been realistic, right? Was there some kind of deeper connection that the Este could have had with Constantinople for the for maintaining some privileged channel with the Ottomans diplomatically, or more? Well, the, the matter is likely more complex than than the prank itself, because the Este House uh, entertained since the 15th century intense and friendly relations with some Islamic dynasts, not, not necessarily just the Ottomans, right? If you look at, for example, figures like Borso uh, or Hercules I, at the time, we're talking about the second half of, of, the, uh, of the 15th century, um, Ferrara was very famous and it still was for artillery and war horses, right? These were a bit the again, because of the feudal imperial legacy, uh, militarized um, dynasties. Uh, even the Gonzaga, famously enough, had uh, developed that kind. We also made a video about uh, Francesco I, for example, that was the first Italian lord to de facto become a condottiere, right? That is to say, these guys were ruling with the local titles um, of the empire and all, but he decided literally to put himself at the service of someone like that. It did not had, uh, yet happen. So there was a, a, a broader prestige, also a chivalric one, a uh, sense that, for example, the North African breeds, horse breeds were, you know, very important. The, the S, again, bragged 
legitimately about their, their technological, uh, zootechnical achievements, guns, war horses, and so on, right? Um, the relations with Muslims were, were normal. Um, in Mediterranean, you always had an opportunity on the North African coast to have this or that guy who also was trying to escape the Ottoman pressure and that would say try to to support we've seen it in the video about the the conquest of Tunis where um, not just the kingdom of Sicily was entrusted with the essentially the, the the control of the North African coast that had been conquered but there had been a substantial support of course they had appointed a local emir uh, in fact, it's the same one that we, we've seen at that time that eventually would take refuge in at the Estes court. Um, and, um, and the Este, through their French channel, were, were also had been uh, at the time in the 15th century particularly connected with the Duchy of Burgundy. Right, and you know that Burgundy was the top chivalric state in Europe. Until they collapsed, everybody was hyped. They had been con uh, conferred the, the, entrusted the, the command of the, albeit failed, as you know, crusades of Nicopolis and, and, and Varna, and they were considered the greatest knights ever, and they host the, the most famous tournaments. Um, and tournament knights uh, at their court, they, they were extremely rich, refined, whatever. Um, and Italy had always been open to French literature since ever. I mean, that was like the normal thing where the various um, chansons, the, um, you know, all the various histories of the past in the, let's say, the medieval present. Now, we're talking about the Renaissance, but they didn't quite distinguish, as we were saying before, in the classical rule. I mean, if you talked about Julius Caesar, you would describe him like a, like a medieval knight, just like in the Roman d'Alexandre, the, you know, the, the the idea that they were fighting, even in, look at the illuminations against enemies that look more like the Turks, whatever, um, had, uh, uh, of course, the Iliad, the Aeneid, etc. So, all the issue that we have seen some months ago, for example, for the Normans, that thought to be descended from from the Trojans, and that brought even um, the 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 Scots to to decide in the 15th century. Uh, I made a video also about that. There were descendants from the Achaeans instead, so that they were superior to the Trojans because they were uh, developing that court literature in an anti-English fashion. There there were all these kind of games, and the the Ferrer race had been quite uh, keen on this orientalistic influence that was part of the chivalric culture of the time right think about Ariosto or Tasso at this point the idea of Jerusalem right being all over right in, in the time of, of uh, religious and uh, confessional wars the revival of the crusading spirit on the base of the, the Ottoman invasions right what we often misunderstand about for example our view of the Crusades as we developed it in Europe in, in the, during the modern contemporary era, is that it, it derives actually from the Ottoman era, right? In in say at the time of the Saracens, in the in the early in the high Middle Ages, um, the say the idea of this uh, Muslim pirate arriving from it well, well, is not at least documented in the terms that was eventually to remain up to this day that instead began from the 16th to 17th century. In Saracen times, things were arguably even worse, depending on which um, criterion you pick, but they hadn't developed that kind of, you know, at least the, the, there wasn't a, the, a, a protraction of that kind of view of the, of the infidel as we have it instead from the modern age. Right. Also, because from in fact the the eleventh century to the sixteenth, so for half of a millennium, but eventually the Mediterranean had been a Christian lake. Right. There was some kind of piracy that, of course, you could find Muslims in it. But this, say the 
the Saracen invasions, this idea of terrible fleets of of Muslims that attacked the northern shores, I mean, it wasn't there, right? Uh, the Mediterranean was dominated by the Italians. And if anything, it was what the other way around. Um, also because the Westerners were dramatically pervasive, right? They arrived as far as Ghana for, for, for the gold, for the ivory, for the slaves, and all this kind of stuff. They were everywhere, right? The Westerners went to China. They, they went everywhere. So there was already this kind of massive outpouring and you wouldn't have i don't know an egyptian fleet or uh, that would harass uh, greece or um until in fact the, the situation was destabilized uh, there in the late middle ages or also the you could find some christians that allied themselves with i don't know the the opposites of tunisia to to harass i don't know angel in sicily things like that but it, it wasn't like there wasn't out there the sense of ah you know it's full of this Islamic raiders now we have to watch out this is something that was potently revived and especially in a country of Italy that as we like Italy that as we've seen before is uh, quite maritime um, geographically speaking and so the, the the concept is of course uh, the the Italian navies at this point were quite committed also were new military orders that had been created ad hoc by the Medici, for example, was the Order of St. Stephen, etc., to protect the coasts from revived, renewed Islamic piracy, as they hadn't seen that before, for centuries, right? So, um, the the idea of the East, the sense of where do, just think about the Ottomans as, as their power, where do these people come from? You know, say, not literally in the sense that the Osman dynasty had emerged from the Bosphorus. I mean, they knew how they had come about, but I mean, what is God's plan about this, right? Of course, this was the, um, you know, uh, the, the, a Christian fault, you know, where or another. I mean, the, these peoples on the Ottoman frontier had understood before the others, of course, that what was the cost of an unaddressed threat, um, like the Ottoman rise, that up to, you know, actually very few decades before even the fall of Constantinople could easily be thwarted by the Westerners. There was nothing teleological about the, uh, say, or deterministic about the Ottomans managing to to conquer as, as much as they did. There were times, I don't know, at the uh, the siege of Belgrade, on the, the, also the, 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 in the second half of the 15th century, where the, there could have been a crusade that could have easily reconquered Constantinople. Even after Lepanto, actually, if the if the Western fleets had pressed further, they could have there, there were chances to retake Constantinople. Eventually, they leave it there. The Ottomans built another fleet from scratch, and eventually they wouldn't use because it, it remained rotting in the in the various ports of the Levant, etc. But Let's say um, this, there was always this sense you could play a bit with the Ottomans. And thus, this was reflected um, also as a chivalric conflict, right? Uh, like in a, in a joust or in a tournament, where the um, the the um, this, uh, taste for the crusade, the even the the, the Eastern origins, the Trojan origins. Right of the Romans of of other great of, of basically of this old great monarchies of Europe that had always boasted uh, again uh, descendants from from the classical heroes would look at Constantinople saying, well, we want to look at this more, right? We want to see that there are opportunities to interact with these guys. There is job for military advisors for. Also, the diplomacy which we, we can achieve through the empire, the, the Ottoman Empire, is, is were important things, evidently. So, this fact of the kingdom of Jerusalem, right? The the same. What do you think? There was a uh, a connection there, also with the Medici. Well, see, uh, Alfonso was very attracted to feasts and spectacles characterized by Eastern fashion, Oriental fashion at the time, it was the state developing in the West at the time, we, we've discussed it before, um, and um, by the way, Alfonso was meant to have, is believed to have spent a dramatic lot in uh, 
courtly fast, right? This this idea that you have to show off to compete with international courts of who was the richest, the most powerful, especially against those damn Medici that had stolen from the the, the place, grand dukes or something, right? Um, Alfonso's father, Hercules II, had hosted in 1548 in Ferrara herself the Emir of Tunis, Muhammad Hassan, that had been fundamentally a philo Christian and had been overthrown, destituted, blinded, and exiled by his son. So the, uh, this guy didn't know where to go. The Esther uh, hosted him because they thought they could. Uh, they could remain connected with some Tunisian power, right, that they could use in the balance of power that, again, is very complicated. Today, we cannot digress here, but yes, the would play. It was always an opportunity to have a friend of some power, some influence, right? Now, Francesco I, the Medici, it was perhaps aware of all this stuff, right? You know, that, I mean... There was a, uh, uh, you know, he, the, he, the, the guy, Alfonso, had married his sister who had died. It seemed there had been this knowledge. The, imagine the gossip existing in courts through spies, diplomats, courtier, uh, etc. Uh, the, the Tuscans have this kind of mocky, uh, kind of caustic, kind of. Uh, tradition pranks right so it, it was a spirit on of their own um and uh, they uh, the, they remembered for example that alfonso had particularly enjoyed a spectacle of dancers and knights uh clothed the islamic way during the party for his marriage that had been celebrated in florence with lucrezia in, in 1558 um, and it's quite likely that Alfonso had become an object of mockery because of his uh, Muslim tastes, right? Consider that um, Alfonso's brother, the Cardinal Luigi uh, of Este, was very attracted uh, by the, the Eastern things. He had at his herb service some Turkish slaves, um, uh, which was normal, you know, in, in, in the same Tuscany, uh, L uh, Livorno, Leghorn had become a very important uh, slave market, right, just like the ones that the Muslims had in North Africa, the Christians had, of all these various prisoners of war and other, but there were the same Muslims selling to them by, by degree, right, it was not just the fruit of some kind of uh, Christian private hearing, because actually even the same uh, religious orders did the fact of the same, or you can quite distinguish it. We were just talking about it in that video about the um, piracy and privateering from the Middle Ages to the Napoleonic era, uploaded and re uploaded the other day. Um, um, furthermore, the Este themselves had this claim that they had descended from ancient Troy exactly how it was said that the Turks uh, would procla had proclaimed themselves the mythical heirs of the Trojans themselves, right? Everybody wanted to be descending from the Trojans. Uh, and in Europe, they had been all over the place in medieval times, and people still believed this. Again, the Este could boast this uh, incredibly old and noble origins, but, um, you know, at least they, they came from the Germanic nobility back in the day, so that was basically it, that there was now no Trojan, you know, maybe some, I don't know, Etruscan uh, nobleman from Asia Minor that had settled several centuries before Christ and had eventually Romanized and had been sent as a as a legionnaire, senator, maybe in Germany during the Roman Empire, you know, could boast the Trojan origin from, you know, for, for, for the German descent. But, you know, that's kind of unlikely to, 
you know, of course, there was nothing to it. It were just myths and legends that, as far as the the Esther or anybody else in the Middle Ages could know about this. Um, the um, that, uh, so for, from from the the point of view of, of the proud Alfonso the Second, um, there was enough for his name to be able to resound surrounded by respect and consideration also on the Bosphorus shores. Um, and uh, w the point is that we don't know so much about what the Ottomans thought of all this because, as you know, uh, the Ottoman side is a bit dumb. Um, we don't have the same amount of documentation or chit-chat or uh, because it was a completely different world and we um, substantially uh, just uh, just can guess at best, you know, what, that they would have, of course, a knowledge of what the taste is in the major, um, say, European uh, courts uh, were. Right, of course, the Ottomans had spies everywhere as much as the Christians had in, in the Ottoman Empire, so... Um, there was surely, uh, you know, an attitude that was chivalric in, the, in from both sides, fundamentally, in, in as much as the idea of a shared culture of some sort, this classical legacy, the fact that the Ottomans were ruling from, literally from where Troy stood, had stood, um, they 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 also had all the the Greeks there that the classical past they, as we've seen they they rival even the the papal tiara fabricated by the way by by some Italian craftsmen that were paid for that and that were also quite you know there was a lot of depictions of Turks there was a general consensus in the West around the fact that people wanted to know about what these people were and documenting it and studying them and in fact we know as you have seen also in, in the videos about the Ottoman military organization that most of the sources about the Ottoman army still today are Italian we don't have much Turkish evidence from there because they wouldn't write or speak or um, like uh, as much as say the Renaissance would in the West Right, so we we factually know Ottoman warfare mostly through Western sources than than the Ottoman ones. This is quite fascinating. It makes you understand so much about how much we m lack from the other side comparatively. Um, and surely we would know about the Ottomans caring at least about these inclina personal inclinations, as you understand. Even Alfonso's one could be, and I guess this is a an interesting topic, but there are countless examples of this stuff, and if you're interested, I can't keep making videos about that. Um, for today, however, I, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. I, as always, Thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.